Welcome to our program, Confusion to Clarity, Understanding Our Politics. I'm Tom Ventimiglia, a counselor and professor at Palomar College. Do you ever wonder why it's so hard to understand different sides of a political or social issue? Conflict seems to define today's presentation of political debate on television, radio, newspapers, and blogs. The purpose of this series is to illuminate how and why the majority of the political left and political right really feel about current issues that affect our lives. In other words, why do liberals and conservatives hold the values they do, which determine how they vote? Our purpose is not to change your mind, but to perhaps move you from confusion to clarity on political issues such as immigration, same-sex marriage, health care reform, abortion, and on and on. With me today are Bill Janil, professor of history, Peter Bowman, political science professor, and Sharon Allen, a professor in multicultural studies. Bill, the modern conversation seems to be about arguing about political issues and arguing about the virtues of conservative values versus liberal values. Can you give us the historical roots of these conservative and liberal values? You know, it's an excellent question and also in so many ways the wrong question you know there is this obsession that we have with the left and the right that all things are liberal issues and all things are conservative issues but that framework of conversation wasn't the framework we had in the 18th century when we look at scholars such as Bernard Balin who discusses in his book the ideological origins of the American Revolution he points out that the conversation that we're having on the verge of the revolution is about a different kind of political system that we believed in this Whig Republican ideology that said that everything was balanced between liberty and authority. And unlike today's system where it's a winner take all, a conservative wants things more conservative, a liberal more liberal, mm -hmm. instead there had to be a balance for proper government. Too much liberty and we fell into anarchy, chaos, licentiousness, and too much uh, of authority led to tyranny. Right. And so that conversation continued through the constitutional period until at such time that our conversation reframed a debate between federal and state rights. Okay. So if the historical conversation was a striking a balance between liberty and authority, Peter, what's the modern conversation about liberal values and conservative values? Well, on the modern right, uh, economically, certainly, the modern right is defined by the individual. Uh, the, the individual is paramount. Individual liberty, uh, individual property rights, individual, and with that, individual responsibility, discipline, work ethic, uh, sort of a Calvinist kind, type of work ethic uh, that uh, essentially suggests that when you put yourself up by the bootstraps, when you decide you want to work hard, you want to, again, apply that work ethic, apply that, that individualist entrepreneurial uh, spirit of ingenuity, well then government uh, not only is uh, not going to help, but government is actually going to hinder. I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan's 1981 inaug inaugural. Uh, government's not the answer to the problem, government is the problem. So when you take those values and apply it to today's conservative policies in the, Repu in the, the base of the Republican Party, we're talking tax cuts, right? cutting taxes and so uh, l giving uh, businesses and, and uh, workers the, 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 the motivation to spend their money, produce, their, uh, produce goods, uh, employment will go up, wages will go up, uh, tax cuts, cutting back on regulations. We don't need such stringent regulatory uh, policies with regard to labor and environmental regulations because the market will self-regulate. The modern right very much is, is based on the idea of enlightened self-interest and that was an Adam Smith uh, phrase coined by a Adam Smith. Right. Uh, enlightened self-interest because businesses and competitors want to make money in the competitive open market they will do the public good. They will produce quality goods at fair market value wages and fair market value prices and serve the public and serve the consumer market because it's in their enlightened self-interest to do so. Mm -hmm. But while the economic right is very much wants limited government, the cultural right 
will sing a different tune. The cultural right will, will advocate law, order, security. That's why much of the Republican Party opposes same-sex marriage, opposes or supports a, 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 a tough crackdown on illegal immigration because law and order, traditional values, and traditional authority figures uh, definitely matter. Now, with the left, the modern left is very much uh, centered on equality. There's a, an egalitarian kind of communitarianism with the modern left, which is the base of the Democratic Party. Uh, and with the left, uh, they, the left assumes that the state of nature is not so much enlightened self-interest, but rather it's a benign state of nature that's been corrupted by the environment of social and economic inequality. Uh, so therefore, the market cannot regulate by itself. The government needs to be uh, come in and proactively regulate the market, protect labor, protect consumers, provide health care reform, uh, make sure that everyone is required to purchase health care, for example, uh, because if we all are required to purchase health care, costs will go down, the pool will expand, and what is what may be sacrificed for the individual certainly will be compensated for with the communitarian whole. And that's what the economic left focuses on. Maybe uh, supporting increased uh, or taxation, increased taxation for the upper middle class or the upper brackets so that they will pay back more and that... Uh, benefits the whole? Benefits the whole. Labor, uh, children, the elderly, the poor uh, uh, will be able, schools will benefit. And when everyone benefits, when workers benefit, then the top tier uh, strata of our society, of our economy benefit. So it's very much collectivism with the left. And yet, at the same time, they want that individual liberty on cultural issues. Uh, so there is a dichotomy within the left and the right, but base, definitely based on, on particular values that will define the policy platforms of today's two major parties. Okay, so we've discussed the sources of conservative values and, and liberal values. And Sharon, um, how have these values played out in history. Can you give us some examples of some sociological movements and groups that came from this tension between conservatives and liberals throughout the years? Sure, sure. One of the first uh, groups that come to mind is the abolitionists back in the early uh, 19th century. And the abolitionists obviously was, uh, their initial goal was framed around this idea of abolishing slavery, of the slavery system that was, that was uh, very much ingrained in, in the United States. And abolitionists were uh, you know, fighting a system that was uh, uh, based on really economic concerns and economic needs. Uh, and they were trying to take it to obviously a moral standpoint uh, but both sides, those that wanted to keep slavery as well as those that uh, were trying to abolish it, uh, would, would uh, fight based on uh, laws, religious uh, uh, proclamations on both sides. Those, uh, uh, there would be religious proclamations for those that uh, supported slavery and, and those that were uh, against it, etc. Within the abolitionist movement, though, women saw an opportunity, I believe, to uh, bring forward the agenda of uh, women's inequality. Uh, and what's interesting, though, is that there was even a split within that. Uh, you have, in the early period, for example, the Grimke sisters, and, and they were very much concerned with racial equality. Uh, they, they were looking to build bridges with the black community. They were looking to uh, uh, make sure that uh, Africans were, were starting to share equally in society. Uh, it, but when women started to put forward women's issues around a quality of women in, in general, and, and unfortunately, it was really about equality of white women. Uh, this is where uh, men started to pull back the reins, so to speak, and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's not go that far. Let's, let's you know, pull it back a little bit. Yeah, we need to focus on, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, slavery, slavery plight, even Frederick Douglass, he at one point, uh, who was very much uh, pro-women suffrage ideas, uh, you know, kind of pulled back and said, you know, well, wait a minute, we don't need to really worry about suffrage right now. Let's concentrate on the black man, getting him freedom, because he will do what's right 
right for his wife, uh, his daughters, just as white uh, men are doing. So women really don't need to vote. Women really don't need to participate too much in society. Men will take care of that for them. Things will fall into place. Things will fall into place, so to speak. Right. So so you have some women that were looking to uh, really address slavery issues, but you have others that were using it to further uh, the agenda of suffrage in general. Okay. So we've talked about uh, conservative and liberal values, but not about how we got to the current day Republican and Democratic parties. Bill, how did that come about? Well, again, it's colorful as most of our history is. Um, if we go back to the Constitution, there are two groups, the anti-federalists who are mostly states' rights and the federalists who are wanting to have this strong central constitutional government, and they were obviously successful in having that passed. Um, the group that centers around Alexander Hamilton as its brainchild, the Federalist Party, uh, first forms in opposition with, again, an interest in more centralized government, a strong army, a uh, strong tax system, uh, strong trade, mm -hmm. uh, versus Thomas Jefferson, who becomes the brainchild of the new Republican Party. And Jefferson's Republicans uh, have an interest in agrarian rights, states' rights. They think government should be more limited. They focus on ultimately the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, these two groups are in tension for much of our early period, the Federalists versus the Republicans, until the Federalists make a statement during the War of 1812 at what's known as the Hartford Convention, mm -hmm. uh, being very critical of the war, which they say the Republicans have been in charge of, only to a few months later, the Republicans win the war, uh, particularly with the new war hero, Andrew Jackson. And so, as a result, the Federalists are discredited as a federal party, and that leaves the Republicans, who are now being known as the Democrat Republicans, just in order to make history students flunk their test later. Right, right. Uh, then this group, the Democrat Republicans, become a one party during the era of good feelings. Those Democrat Republicans will splinter, because one party can't be happy to have forever. We can't have that in America. Oh, no, no. <laughs> and so, as a result, in fact, there's one election where we have four people all from the same party running against each other, which is vastly entertaining. Nice. Um, and the emergence of that fight is a group called the National Republicans, which die out immediately under John Quincy Adams, and then the Democratic Party under Andrew Jackson. And it's the Democratic Party under Andrew Jackson that is our modern Democratic Party. In opposition to the new parties form, the Whigs, and then ultimately their successors, which we'll see with some Free Soilers and other movements that coalesce ultimately to Lincoln's Republican Party, which is the Republican Party of today. Okay. Very interesting. I mean, so Bill talks about the two-party system. Mm -hmm. Peter, certainly uh, we vote for more parties at the ballot box. Who are those parties and what do they stand for? Well, um, there are a number of parties uh, on the ballot here in California and other states will uh, recognize uh, based on state election ballot access laws. Other, there, for example, Florida recognizes the National Socialist Party and the Democratic Worker Socialist Party, whereas California recognizes the Peace and Freedom Party and what have you. Um, so there are different parties throughout the country that are recognized on different ballots in different states. Uh, two examples of parties that are recognized here in California and most other states, the Libertarian Party and the Green Party. The Libertarian Party is seen more as a, as a hard right party. Um, take the values of conservatism, of modern day economic conservatives, and just magnify it by about two, three times. Mm -hmm. And that's the modern day Libertarian Party. They don't want to cut taxes, they want to all but abolish taxes. They don't want to cut the size of the federal government. They want to all but abolish the federal government, except for maybe a bit of the, of the, the, pen, of the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to uh, cut back on regulations or deregulate somewhat. They want to strip away all regulations. They want a pure, laissez-faire form of market capitalism. Think and Rand. Uh, think Ron Paul, uh, and Ron Paul knew Ayn Rand, and Ron Paul was an in, was influenced by Ayn Rand, uh, and their influence. The libertarians are based on a very fundamental, what I call a very literal version of Lockean classical liberalism of the 17th and 18th century. Uh, they believe that natural law is sovereign to government. Government's not sovereign. 
contrary to what most conventional people and scholars think, government is not sovereign. Uh, natural law is sovereign. The same kind of natural law, physical laws of science and gravity that dictate that if I jump on the top of this or I get on the top of this building and I jump off, I'm going to fall. I'm not going to, gravity's not going to, gravity's not going to debate whether it wants to spare me uh, because I'm a great guy. I'm going to fall, right? Uh, the same, that same kind of natural law dictates that all human beings are born in a natural state of freedom. Life, liberty, and property, the Lockean uh, pillars of, of natural, natural freedom. Uh, and so government is there to preserve those natural laws, no more, no less, a minimal state. Once government expands, once government starts to regulate, once it starts to tax us, starts to uh, uh, regulate our firearms, the means of protecting our life, liberty, and our property, well, we've got the right to overthrow. Locke said it, uh, Jefferson said it in the Declaration of Independence, and libertarians, uh, when they evade their taxes, they're not being illegal. They're recognizing their natural rights. The government is being illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the libertarians, essentially. Mm -hmm. The Green Party, again, take the, the base economic left of the Democratic Party, magnify that by three times. Mm. Uh, Greens today in America are equivalent, maybe a bit more to the left, of the European left socialist parties or democratic, uh, social democratic parties or right. labor parties. Right. Uh, they want heavy taxation, much heavier taxation on the wealthy. They want, a lot, uh, they want heavier regulations, environmental-based and labor regulations, a lot heavier than the Democratic Party would ever dare to put on their, on their party platform. Right. Uh, they, want, they advocate a kind of, of uh, nationalized, single-payer government health care system that many European economies have way beyond anything that President Obama would ever dare to think about. Uh, Obama is not a socialist. The Greens, far to the left of the Democratic Party, are a lot more socialist. So uh, our third parties, minor parties, tend to be very ideologically based, from libertarians on, on, the, on the hard right uh, and, liber and Greens on the, on the hard left. Of course, libertarians would take issue with me uh, classifying them on the hard right because, well, they're culturally conventionally left. The Amsterdam model, they want to legalize all drugs. Forget medicinal marijuana. They want to legalize all drugs in the tradition of, of, of Amsterdam, right? And uh, prostitution, gambling, all these social vices, uh, make it, legalize it, maybe regulate it, but no, legalize it and have it completely open because we are sanctioned sovereign individuals. So yes. the libertarians are hard to, to pinpoint on the left-right spectrum. Okay. But that describes it really well. And Peter's illuminated how libertarianism is associated with the right. Sharon, we hear this word uh, progressives and progressives being associated with the left. Is that true? And what is this progressive sociological movement? Sure, sure. Well, there was a progressive movement, obviously, that, that spanned, oh, I don't know, around uh, late 1800s through to the early 1900s. And progressives themselves, it was an exciting time that both Democrats and Republicans embraced. It was a time when uh, the country was looking at, uh, industry was obviously very big, uh, and uh, but but there had been no laws governing workers. For example, child labor laws uh, come into being at this time, uh, labor laws surrounding women. Uh, there were, uh, and, and interestingly, from a progressive standpoint, uh, you know, unions saw an opportunity here too, because as you start to develop laws that, that assist workers, uh, you also have unions that are in a position to uh, insert themselves as, as the go-between so to speak. So it was an exciting time in many different ways in terms of governing. Uh, it's also too a time when uh, you, there was a, almost a decentralizing in a way. States start to develop a lot of power at this time. Uh, you know, you have uh, a time when women's movement uh, comes to the forefront. We now start to have the vote. Uh, suffrage issues come forward that culminate in the vote, so to speak. So uh, the progressives, really uh, uh, addressed many of the social ills, quote unquote, for lack of a better word. But there was also a very, very dark side 
to, to this too, because you start to have a lot of overregulation that starts to happen. You also, it's, it's from the progressives that ideas like eugenics come to the forefront. Can you, can you define eugenics? Well, eugenics, it, it's uh, interesting. I, initially, the idea behind it was that humankind will correct nature in a way. So eugenics at its heart, it was about correcting any type of uh, uh, diseases that, that were in the body that maybe you were even born with, chronic illnesses or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is that there becomes a very moralistic ideology that comes into place. And, uh, you know, uh, eugenics at its finest even involves sterilization. See, this is the problem. If you have uh, some kind of hereditary illness or, or uh, you know, any, any type of issue at all that may be hereditary, uh, you could sterilize yeah. a woman so that, or a man so that neither one of them could procreate. Well, what starts to happen, however, though, is as these clinics start to develop, uh, certain morally based issues like alcoholism, comes to the forefront. Uh, so not only do you have, you know, uh, uh, laws that are, that are coming around prohibition, but now if someone is considered an alcoholic, they could go in for, you know, any kind of a medicinal checkup and they could leave sterilized. Mm. Or let's say a woman was considered, uh, you know, to be to be very uh, morally loose, whatever that meant at that time, right? She could come out sterilized. Terrible. In other words, it wasn't their choosing. This was done to them without them even knowing it. Without their right? consent, without their knowledge. Uh. Uh, what's amazing about this is, is that many people got their lives together, mm. okay? Alcoholics recovered, uh, you know, women that were going through certain emotional issues, you know, ended up to go on to, to marry, have families, or not went into business and later on they met somebody that they were interested in having children with they married or whatever and they would go into the doctor asking why can't you know we get pregnant what's going on is you know the count law or whatever and they would find out that they were sterilized mm. and only virginia so far of all the states that we have has had the decency to apologize for exactly these, uh, exactly laws. yes it was a chronic because it, this went on through up and through to the 1970s mm -hmm. it's incredible when, when you really consider it and what were some it, of the you know issues that they the things that they were tackling in the 40s 50s 60s 70s that seems that wasn't that long ago it wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't that long ago. And actually, this idea of uh, pure, right, uh, you know, whether we're talking about pure democracy or whether we're talking about a pure society, uh, it, it started to uh, take on some very dark connotations. Well, this mm -hmm. eugenics, for example, this was the playbook, the, the foundation that Hitler used. So uh, did it start around the 19, uh, beginning of the 20th century? In the beginning of the yes. 1900s? Yes, yes. Progressivism is one of those unusual kinds mm -hmm. of movements and the fact that, again, you ask about what are the origins of left and right? Mm -hmm. Well, progressivism is an unusual movement in that much of what we think of as the religious right, but also some of what's today called the progressive left, mm -hmm. come from the progressive movement. Right. Um, right. If you think of the anti-alcohol movement, the Women's Temperance mm -hmm. League, Carrie Nation, right. uh, who was a, a crusader that came in with axes and chopped up saloons. Mm -hmm. uh, these are examples of what today would be sort of the religious right, okay? And they were part of the progressive movement. But so too were anti-monopolists, trust busters, right. you know, from exactly. the economic side. Mm -hmm. There were those who wanted to reform the political system. And so here in California, we ended up having the initiative system and all of these ideas right. of let's take uh, the, the ideas away from the, the, the legislature and the parties are corrupt. Let's mm -hmm. have the people mm -hmm. vote on everything. And referendums? And, uh, and, referendums and yeah. initiatives are similar. They are, uh, it depends on who's making them. An initiative from the people, referendum from a legislature. Right. Um, and, you know, and also, for example, this, this illustrates how that the parties have changed. I mean, at one time, again, inside of this progressive movement, 
uh, well, even the, the parties themselves would, would be different on different issues. Uh, maybe taxes or tariffs. Tariffs was an issue that at one time was very strong for the Republican Party, starting with Benjamin Harrison mm -hmm. and strong protective tariffs, which was a big Republican thought, which nowadays would be uh, abhorrent to the political economic right mm -hmm. and instead has become something more democratic in its nature. Right, mm -hmm. right. One of the most complicated, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, please. One of the most complicated is Margaret Sanger, okay? And not a lot of feminists like to bring up certain issues about Margaret Sanger. She was known, she pro promoted uh, uh, women having the right to choose in terms of uh, controlling their their own bodies. Uh, she, she was actually, what, wasn't she denied her citizenship at one term mm. and she had to go to Europe because of birth control. Okay, birth control, once it was brought into the country, once it was, you know, women were taught how to, how to use it and the freedoms that went around with that. She was uh, demonized, okay, but she was also uh, uh, the woman that stood up in front of Ku Klux Klan meetings. Mm. She was also the woman that worked with the Ku Klux Klan and encouraged, okay, black women, black men to sterilize themselves. Mm. And this is where it gets very, obviously, very demonic. Mm. And, uh, you know, you don't hear a lot of feminist, a lot of feminist discourse on, on the complicated nature mm -hmm. of, of, like I say. And Peter, you were going to mention well, I wanted to follow up on Bill's earlier point on yeah. how po policy positions within the parties have shifted over the years. Um, essentially, policy positions are not the crucial measurement of where you place groups on the, on the left-right continuum, ideologically. It's all about values. Right. For example, take the issue of immigration. Uh, this issue is dividing the Republican Party of the modern day. Uh, because of the conflicting values within different uh, members of the Republican Party community. Uh, th those Republicans who are taking a, I guess, conventionally liberal view on the immigration issue, uh, they want uh, to expand legalized immigration or a path to legal immigration or at least uh, a path to a guest worker program. Guest worker, right. uh, well, they're taking an economic conservative view based on values of the free market, expand labor, expand, uh, let the good workers weed out the bad workers and let the market and competition dictate uh, good for business. So. Yet, so therefore they have that view, but then you have the socially conservative uh, Republicans, the Tom Tancredos, the, the Duncan Hunters, for right. example, that are saying, no, uh, we don't want to reward uh, lawbreakers. Let's have, uh, let's, let's emphasize the values of traditional order, security, uh, strengthening our border. So if you take these economic values and these cultural values that are both part of conservatives, it's dividing the Republican Party up. Right. Okay. Fascinating. Uh, any final thoughts? Bill? Again. We get so obsessed with liberal versus conservative today, but to truly understand where we are now, again, as a historian, look to the past and see how these issues have changed over time. Okay, great, great. Peter. The left, economic, communitarian, egalitarianism, and liberty, the right, order, and yet economic individualism. Okay, mm -hmm. Sharon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was been demonstrated today so well is that wh whether you're on the left, on the right, no matter what political party you're involved in, that there are many different layers to to these issues, to persons' perspectives and their values, and that many of those layers are quite dark. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. it's not all sweetness and light on either side. Okay, great. Yeah, it's not always doesn't always come out. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. The core issues that we've been looking at today have fueled modern debates regarding the wars abroad, issues surrounding energy and the environment, the Middle East conflicts, and so forth. We hope we've helped you to examine and understand our politics so you can both make an informed choice at the ballot box as well as sharpen the values you choose to live by. In the future programs, we will address some of these topics in more depth. Thank you for being with us. Take good care.